Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. One of my favorite traditions around this time of the year is Easter egg hunts. I loved them as a child. And at my grandparents' home, Easter egg hunts were not just for children. My grandmother had a large backyard that extended from a generously sized covered patio. She had a green thumb and there were large potted plants all throughout the porch. And in the yard, in addition to overgrown trees, there were rose bushes of just about every color. Before Easter, my grandmother would busy herself with making all of the hard boiled eggs, and then she would dye them. I think in an effort to be a little more tricky, she would dye those Easter eggs all different shades of green and brown, subtle earth tones. Occasionally there would be the rare pink or blue egg, but they were mostly earth tones. And then on the day of the Easter egg hunt, the couple of adults who were in charge of hiding the eggs had so much fun placing them in hard to find locations. For example, the rare pink egg was sometimes on the ground right next to a rose petal that had fallen of the same shade of pink. My sister and I still laugh about the memory that we have of one of my great aunts climbing up in the tree, her hand reaching for one of those brown eggs, while her sister, another one of our great aunts, was standing on the ground looking up at the tree and hollering, Winnie Mae, don't you dare touch that egg. It's mine. I saw it first. As we like to say, the adult Easter egg hunts in my family were kind of like a competitive sport. Scholars actually suggest that the origin of this tradition of Easter egg hunt, hunting um, dates back to the 16th century when Protestant reformer Martin Luther would organize Easter egg hunts for his congregation. And it was the custom for the men to go out and hide the eggs and for the women to find them. This was a nod to the resurrection story in which the empty tomb was discovered by the women. It was on that first Easter that the women walked to the place where the dead body of Jesus lays. Jesus, their dear friend and teacher. Jesus, the victim of a state-sanctioned execution. Their grief their sorrow, their love for him carried them to his graveside. And as their tradition instructed, they were there to anoint the dead body. But the body was not there. In their confusion, they encounter two angels who are dressed in what the Bible describes as dazzling clothes. I imagine them decked out in their Easter finest. They tell the women what is going on, and I imagine them like good Sunday morning ushers. They greet the women and they provide them with the latest up-to-date information. I can hear them saying, I know it's kind of habit to show up here, but you will recall that Jesus himself said that he will rise again on the third day. 
It's been in the e-connection. It's been in the last few bulletins and on the website. You may have missed the announcement, but I'm here to tell you Jesus isn't here. You won't find him in the tomb. You'll find him alive out there in the world. The women go to share this news with the apostles, but the apostles don't buy what the women are saying. The disciples don't think it's true. And while it is perhaps typical that the men don't believe the women, and while it is not okay that the men blow them off, it is understandable. Understandable that it takes a while for the good news to sink in. I share this, dear friends, because if you find yourself this Easter day with a mood that does not match the Easter alleluias and all the joys and flowers, it is okay. Given the weight of the world's pain and only you and God know what you are carrying, like the earliest disciples, we might hear about this invitation to step out and to find the things of hope and life in the world, only to hear it as an idle tale. Hear this. In the lesson for today, there is no evidence that God chastises us for living somewhere between doubt and belief. If It is African-American liturgist Cole Arthur Riley who talks about doubt saying this, doubt is not a threat to faith. It is faith that has finally taken off its mask. If you find it difficult to believe in God or anything else in this season, it is okay. You've seen death. You've endured sorrow. To believe is to risk. Doubt doesn't alienate you from the divine. It often means that you're approaching it. It is a helpful reminder that Easter morning doesn't begin with trumpets blasting and lilies in full bloom. It doesn't begin with alleluias and the picture-perfect Easter photo. No, the first Easter morning begins so early that the sun has not yet made its appearance. It is dark. The air is thick with grief and fear. Some seasons, it can take a while to rub the doubt and worry from our eyes, to lift our heads and to find the things of life and hope in the world. New life amidst the ashes, the living among the dead, to sense the resurrection power of Jesus cut loose in the world. You know, Easter, Easter is certainly, of course, about what happened to the once dead body of Jesus. But it is also about what happened to those women and to those disciples. And we tell the story of that first Easter still today because it is about what can happen to us too. It's in his epic novel, David Copperfield, that, that um, Charles Dickens writes these words. It's in vain to recall the past unless it works some influence on the present. So today we recall the past, the resurrection of Christ. And if we risk believing, as Cole Arthur Riley puts it, we can trust that it influences us still today. Now, I haven't read that book, David Copperfield, but I did recently read a reimagining of this novel written by Barbara Kingsolver. It's called Demon Copperhead. I wonder if some of you may have read it. It is so good. And after I read this book, I looked up some reviews, as I often do when I finish a book, and I stumbled upon a Christian writer who was troubled with the strong language in this book. But the book group that I am proud to be a part of, privileged to be a part of, we were troubled more by the injustices that this book exposes. It's set in the southern mountains of Appalachia and all around looms the opioid crisis and the myriad of intersecting challenges and issues. The central figure is this boy named Demon 
And of course, it's his nickname. His real name is Damon, but all through the book, he is referred to as Demon. At one point in the book, he sets out on a journey. He begins to walk a mountain trail, and he's forgotten to pack any food or any other provisions. He's run out of the pain pills that he's been taking. He is tired. He is hungry. He is thirsty. He is alone. He has hit rock bottom for the up to umpteenth time in his life. And here, all alone in the woods, in this situation in which he finds himself, he suddenly has a vision. And in this vision, a man appears in front of him. The man is Mr. Peggett, who happened to die many chapters earlier. And now dead Mr. Peggett, who was a father figure for him, stands before him and Demon says to him, sorry for everything. And he hears Mr. Peggett reply, was that so hard to do? And Demon goes on, reflecting on this conversation that he has with the late, once dead Mr. Peggett. He says, it was his voice, his words, my ears. I'm not suggesting that any of this makes any sense. And I can imagine that's what some of the women thought at the empty tomb. None of this seems to make any sense. Demon goes on. I got up and moved on. It is hard to live when you can see the opposite coming down the road at you. I looked at the trail and the dirt and the moss. The woods were their own show. And I was delirious, but I felt some things. The deer family that had left their tracks in the muddy trail. I felt the kindliness of the moss, which is all over everywhere once you get into the woods and out of the made world. God's flooring. Some tiny dead part of me woke up to the moss and said, man, where have you been? This is, of course, a pivotal moment for the young man of waking up from what he calls his long slumber underwater, of choosing life, not the choosing that comes from hard work and effort, more like the choosing of surrendering to a new day, giving in to the risk of believing, accepting an invitation to possibility. Here at University UMC, all throughout the season of Lent, we have been looking at spiritual practices, those things that we can do that help us stay in love with God and neighbor. And surely, surely how we spend our time and money and resources, that can all be very important. But here's the thing about a day like today. Here's the thing about Easter. Easter is less about our action or inaction, and it is much more about paying attention to God's action in the world. Resurrection is less about our effort and more about surrendering to the efforts of God, noticing when hope shows up, noticing moments of wonder and awe, the chance that something more, something better is possible. Poet Wendell Berry writes about the, the whole business of practicing resurrection, and he says it like this. It looks like loving the Lord, loving the world, loving someone who doesn't deserve it. It looks like asking questions that have no answers, doing something that won't compute, choosing joy, even though you have considered all the facts. I was in middle school when my grandmother died. It was then that I grappled with the shock and horror of death like I never had before. I didn't know what I believed, much less if I believed anything at all. And it was later that spring that I found myself outside at her house Deep in the yard, by the property line's fence, I looked down, and I bet you can guess what I discovered in the grass. An Easter egg. 
grandma with me in ways new and old. I found it, like those women of long ago who discovered the empty tomb. I found joy mixed with grief. I saw new life in the midst of death. And in all of my doubting, I risked believing that life mattered, that life was good. Be joyful, be joyful all ye saints, for today earth and heaven have met in the resurrection power of Jesus. Christ is risen where, O oh, death is your sting. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Amen.